glad my wife thinks I'm a good guy. <laughs> um, all right, so yeah, when uh, when Josh Amerson reached out to me to come up here and uh, speak to you guys, I think it was probably week 13 or 14 of the NFL season, and first thing was is, man, I'm so excited to get back to Atlanta that of course I'll do it. Uh, and then as time went, went on and it got closer and closer, um, I don't really like public speaking very much. I know I, get, I have to do it sometimes playing uh, in the NFL and stuff, but um, it's definitely an opportunity for me to get out of my comfort zone. Uh, and so this is uh, my chance to share my testimony and story with you guys. I'm going to kind of do this in a different way. I've uh, set up a, present, uh, a PowerPoint presentation. Hopefully uh, you guys take some points from this. But I uh, just wanted to start it off by letting you guys know that I'm far from the DUMC best man, but I'm sure as heck trying. Um, I'm a sinner, just like the rest of you guys saved by grace, uh, you know, thankful to our Lord and Savior. Uh, I don't have a clicker, so I'm going to make weird hand gestures to the back at times, <laughs> not like trying to point at you guys and stuff. Um, so something we do with the Buffalo Bills, uh, our head coach is Sean McDermott. Um, he's one of the best leaders I've ever uh, been around uh, in the NFL. He, he's a very strong Christian, and he leads out front with his faith uh, in his team meetings. He proclaims his faith a lot, um, which doesn't happen much in the NFL. So this is something that he, he has, that he started doing, and he has every player that joins our team do. And it's, uh, he asked the question, is, he said, uh, why do you do what you do? And you have to go in front of your entire team and present for just a few minutes on, on why you do what you do. So my next cue, there we go. So this is why I do what I do. This is, uh, this is my beautiful family. Uh, this is my wife, Kirsten. We've been married for uh, a little over five years now. Um, you know, she's, she's been through it all with me. She's, the NFL's been crazy. Uh, life's been crazy. We've, we live in Buffalo. That's crazy enough. Um, but, yeah, she's, I mean, she's the rock. She keeps the house in order. She keeps me in line. She um, definitely keeps me out of trouble. Um, below is Spider-Man, a.k.a. Weston. This was uh, his fourth birthday uh, on Saturday, and this was a picture from it. He's shooting a spider web if you guys, if you guys can't get that out. But, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he goes to school here at DUMC. He's uh, in the toddler fours, and uh, my wife graciously signed me up to coach a soccer team again this year. Got an email saying, Coach DeMarco, your team's ready for you. And I'm like, what's going on? Um, so I'll be out there coaching the soccer team. Um, but he's, you know, I, when I look at him, I, that kind of emulates kind of my faith story and like, I want to be a father, a husband, a man that he looks up to and that he grows up to be one day. So uh, he definitely keeps me on my toes. And then got my beautiful little pistol daughter there up there, Sutton. Uh, she's a year and a half, and she is quite the personality. She is all over the place. She goes to school here as well. I'm sure you'll see both of them running up and down church or the aisles here one of these days. Um, no, but, man, that's... It's truly a blessing. I mean, football is, I have plenty of scars, and I've had several surgeries and a lot of different things, and I do it to show them what hard work is, what uh, being a man of Christ is like, um, and ultimately, uh, you know, the good Lord's blessed me with a lot of talents and abilities, and football is one of the big ones, and it's given us a huge head start in life, uh, being, I'm just turned, or I'm about to turn 31, and football's uh, opened a lot of doors for me and, and has really, uh, you know, pushed my career path forwards. So, next one. All right, so my childhood dreams. Um, I started playing football in the third grade. Uh, I played every sport growing up. I played soccer, basketball, baseball. Um, my mom was very hesitant on letting me play football, as I'm sure a lot of y'all's wives are with your kids. Um, but as soon as I started playing it, I, I was hooked. Uh, it was kind of like a drug to me. It was like, you're telling me I can put pads on and hit this kid as hard as I can? <laughs> like, who the heck doesn't want to do that? Um, so I started playing in the third grade, um, and my favorite player growing up was, believe it or not, Mike Allstott, fullback in the NFL. So when I was in fourth or fifth grade, when he started to take off, I, I wore number 40. I remember when I was uh, playing in the yard with my dad, I would take my shirt off and I'd flip it over. You remember he used to wear that big horse collar in the back. And so I was like, man, I'm Mike Allstott, Dad, you better watch out or I'll run you over. But like, sometimes I still have to sit there and pinch myself that like, 
I am playing fullback in the NFL, just like Mike Allstott was. Um, uh, just a quick story, but my first preseason game uh, was when I was playing with the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, I went through a lot of obstacles to even get to this first preseason game, and when the national anthem was going on, I just kind of sat there and I started crying to myself, like, like this is a dream come true. Who would have thought that this would have ever happened for a kid who's a two-star coming out of high school, was really not recruited. People said I got a scholarship to South Carolina because Kurt Spurrier and my uncle were buddies, and thankful they were. I mean, who knows what would have happened. <laughs> um, but I, I, I literally, and I remember as I was sitting there and kind of crying to myself, uh, I just remember telling myself I'm not going to let this opportunity pass. I'm going to make the most of it, and I'm, I'm really going to go for it because it was so dang hard to get here. I'm not going to let this one slip by. So I'm going to kind of run through my, how my NFL career has unfolded, um, and I'm going to kind of talk about my faith and stuff after that, as my faith has played a huge part in that. Um, but that's going to probably be in a couple slides. So uh, as everybody knows, I went to the University of South Carolina, go Gamecocks. I know there's a lot of Bulldogs and Hokies and just a bunch of people around here, but we got a few Gamecocks, so we're holding it down. Um, but coming out of, uh, you know, getting recruited out, like I said, I was a two-star coming out, didn't have – hardly any offers, um, was kind of, I was the lowest recruit in my entire recruiting class at the University of South Carolina, uh, went through, played four years there, actually set the school record for games played during my time in South Carolina, played in 53 career games uh, in my four years there, and that's since been broken, dang it, but, um, but no, it's been really cool, but uh, coming out, I was, uh, I was undrafted, I'll kind of go through that whole process, because that was another mini scar I had, but uh, so my birthday's April 30th, and that was kind of towards the, that was the last day of the draft. So I was down in Orlando with uh, Kirsten, my wife now, but girlfriend at the time, and we had a bunch of family and friends over, and we were having like a birthday draft party, like not knowing if I was going to get drafted or not, and I thought I was, I was rounds five to seven to maybe undrafted, and fifth round went by, no phone call, sixth round went by, no phone call. Seventh round, my phone rings, but it's my buddy calling to get the gate code to get into my parents' house. <laughs> um, so that was a huge, huge letdown. And then seventh round went, and, and I didn't get drafted. So I'm sitting there, and we have all these people over for a party, and I'm super excited and just start, start to tank a little bit. Um, but everything happens for a reason, and unfortunately, that, that year was a lockout year. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that, but that was 2011. So they had the draft, and then usually right after the draft comes uh, undrafted free agency where guys that aren't drafted are scooped up by teams a day or two. Um, that didn't happen. I went three months. Uh, the lockout was, didn't, went all the way up until the end of July, um, and then teams were finally able to start negotiating with free agents. So I was actually working at a desk, uh, front desk at a gym, uh, in Columbia, South Carolina. In the meantime, like, I need to stay in shape. Who knows if this is going to happen or not. Uh, so that's just also part of my story. But I ended up signing with the San Diego Chargers, um, and I left everything I knew on the East Coast. Uh, you know, I grew up in Orlando, Florida, went to school in South Carolina. I've always kind of been, I'm a good Southeastern boy. And I went out to San Diego, California, where it is way different and way more expensive. Um, so I signed out there, and you know I was just thrilled. It was my, it was my opportunity to chase my dream. Um, and so we were going through the whole process of starting up training camp. In the third day of training camp, I made a simple cut, and I broke my foot. Um, I'm hard-headed and stubborn, and that's why I've had so much success in this league. But I broke my foot, and I think it was like the second drill period, and I finished practice. Uh, on a broken foot, and then I went in the training room right after it, and I just said, can I get a bag of ice? Like, I didn't want to be the inconvenient rookie. I was just happy to be there. I was happy to have the jersey and get the free cleats. Um, <laughs> and so they said, well, what's going on? I told them, I said, uh, my foot's bugged me. My foot's swollen up a little bit. And the, the trainer put me up on the training table, and he started touching and feeling, and he saw how tender it was, and he said, well, you either have a really bad sprain or you broke your foot. We're going to have to go get, an, go get an x-ray. And I'm like, no, no, just give me the ice and let me go. Um, but he didn't let me. So I ended up uh, having surgery three days later, or no, two days later. Um, and another one of my scars is uh, three days after surgery, I was sitting in the training room uh, with a couple other hurt guys. 
and one of the guys from the player personnel department came rolling in, and he goes, uh, who's Pat DeMarco? I'm like, me? Just signed a contract with you three days ago? Um, and he goes, uh, give me your playbook. Give me your, um, we don't want you to go to meetings. We don't want you to go to practice. You're not going to go to games. We're going to set you off off-site with a PT. We're going to get you a gym membership. And, I'm, and I said, I want to go back home. If, if you guys don't want me here and you're not going to, you know, fulfill your end of the bargain here, then I don't want to be here. Plus, rent's 3000 bucks, and I got 500 bucks back in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, so I went back to Columbia, South Carolina. After that, I was, I was placed on the injured reserve uh, that entire year, which means uh, you can't play. And actually, the team doctor put the wrong screw in my foot, so it should have been like an eight- to ten-week recovery process. took six months or seven months. So I ended up getting uh, cleared in April of the following year. And I think it wasn't within 24 hours after the doctor in Columbia, South Carolina cleared me that my phone rang, uh, San Diego Chargers. Hey, Pat, can you fly out here? They cut me the next day. Um, just the nature of the beast. Um, so I went uh, like three or four months from April going into training camp. Um, and I told my agent, I said, I still want to pursue it if the opportunity arises. He told me, Pat, it's slim pickings. Uh, you know, you're an undrafted rookie. You just got hurt. You're coming off a foot, which is not a very fond injury in NFL terms. Um, so I was, as I was going through that process, um, I was – trying to figure out what exactly my B plan was because my A plan was so invested in playing football. Um, so I went and met with Coach Furrier, uh, who was at South Carolina at the time, and I asked him if he, was, if he had a GA spot, a graduate assistant spot, to maybe get into the coaching world and I was going to uh, pursue an MBA. And three days before I was uh, going to take the GRE, my agent called and said, uh, how are you doing? Like, how's your weight? How's everything going? Uh, he said, the, the Chiefs want to work you out. And he said, Pat, what's your weight? And I'm like, oh, I'm like 226 right now. And he goes, all right, cool. It'll be 235 tomorrow morning because you're flying out to Kansas City. <laughs> so I went out with Kirsten, and we bought like three of those, like two liters of Gatorade, and I just drank and ate everything inside. I waited at 233 the next morning. Um, and I had to immediately run a 40-yard dash, which did not feel great. It was seven <laughs> extra pounds. Um, so I signed with the Chiefs. Um, and uh, that's kind of a story in itself because my agent was representing a kid that was one of their fullbacks, and he failed his physical. Um, so kind of the stars really had to align. So he failed his physical going into training camp, and they, you know, the team had to call my agent to let him know that you know your your kid is, isn't going to be with us because he didn't pass his physical. And my agent's like, well, 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 I got this other kid who's probably better than the kid you're signed, but he's coming off an injury and this and that. So. They ended up working me out, and I signed during training camp. Um, you know, I was just happy to be there and happy for the opportunity. That's when it goes back to that story about that first preseason game where I just told myself I'm not letting this, uh, this opportunity pass. And I was actually – so the way the NFL works is you go through all training camp and then cuts are made. And so I was cut right after training, right after training camp, but when I was in Scott Pioli's office, the GM, he told me, he said, Pat, you've done a lot more than we thought you were going to do. You've, we weren't planning on keeping a fullback at all. Uh, coming in, but, um, you know, you've done so much that we want to keep you on our practice squad. So I'm like, please, where do I sign? Like, give me this contract. Um, so I'd sign on the practice squad. I was on the practice squad for uh, 10 or 11 weeks, and then they activated me, so I played my first NFL game, my second year out of college, and uh, dream come true. The first, the first play, we were in kind of an outside zone right, and Jamal Anderson was scraping over the top. And I'm like licking my chops because I see him rolling over the top. And I just, I lay into him and put him on his back and I pancake him. And like, I'm finally like, all right, this game isn't that hard. <laughs> I, I got this. I got this. I've been humbled many times since then, obviously. Um, but we went 2-14 and 14 that year. And the way the NFL works is it's kind of a what have you done for me lately business. And no success means no jobs. Uh, so about 60% of that roster was turned over the the head coaching staff, the GM, everybody basically clean-shopped, and I caught the wrong end of that stick. Uh, but thankfully, I did that, and I signed in, uh, in Atlanta uh, two weeks after that. So uh, when me and my wife left Kansas City, um, we went back to Orlando, Florida after I was cut, and we put all our stuff in storage there, and we're like, we'll, we'll see what's going to happen next. And um, so the Falcons called me and signed me 
during OTA, so I went through that whole process, uh, OTAs and training camp, and then uh, after that first uh, training camp, again, I was, we weren't planning on keeping you, we were planning on just having you as a body, and you proved us wrong, so we're going to keep you on our practice squad, so I spent two weeks on the practice squad in Atlanta, and then was activated that third week, and, and played four years there, um, you know, four amazing years there, it's, you know, my wife loved Atlanta, I love Atlanta, that's ultimately why we're still here, um, so four great years. I mean, those years are kind of the easy ones. So, and then the next, uh, and then so finally, so the business of the NFL is you want to get to free agency. Like that's your chance to really make a contract and make some money. The average life in the NFL, I think right now is two point eight years. Um, so, and you don't become an unrestricted free agent until your fourth year. So, going into my seventh year, I was finally an unrestricted free agent. Like, man, the day's here. I made a Pro Bowl. I was all pro. Just finished playing the Super Bowl. Like, man, I'm about to finally get some money. I'm finally going to, you know, really show what I can do. And when I was negotiating, I was really negotiating with three teams. I was with uh, the Falcons, with the Bills, and with uh, the San Francisco 49ers. Um, So you guys know Kyle Shanahan took the head coaching job in San Francisco. Uh, Coach Quinn in, in Atlanta wanted to keep me. And then Buffalo, uh, so Sean McDermott's head coach there, he was with the Carolina Panthers, who we played against in our division twice a year. And for some reason, he just fell in love with me and and wanted me to sign up there. But going through the negotiation process, Atlanta offered me a three-year deal, and how it all happened um, was kind of crazy. But they offered me a three-year deal, and it was late that night, and my, my, my granddad was actually basically on his deathbed and was about to die. And I basically told them, I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't want to make a decision right now. So you can send me over the contract. I'll read it over in the next morning. Uh, I'll let you guys know. And right after I got off the phone with them, my agent called me and was like, it's like, dude, the bills just called. And they said, how much money is it going to take to sign Pat DeMarco in Buffalo? And we're like, this is our moment. Like, this is it. Um, and going through negotiations, uh, when I was talking with my agent, I was like, that's awesome. But. Buffalo's probably in my 30s on the teams I want to be in. <laughs> then there's 32 teams. I'm like, Buffalo's somewhere in the 30s on the teams I really want to sign with right now. So let's, let's go back to Atlanta and go back to San Francisco and see if they can get near it, like just kind of near it. Um, but I, when I, I'll touch on this a little bit later. But my grandpa had a huge uh, influence on me. Uh, as he was on his deathbed, he kind of really poured into me. Uh, I'll touch on that in a little bit. But I've had this just never give up mentality my entire career. Um, you know, I've been cut four times, um, and that's not it, – it is typical in, a few, in some stories in the NFL, but it's not in most stories. Most stories are guys drafted in the second round, he plays in one place in his entire career, he's drafted in the second round, and then he goes to free agency, and he breaks the bank, and he signs somewhere else, and he plays for six more years. He plays a 10-year career, and boom, done. He's, you know, living great. Um, so, I mean, from, from being cut four times – I was selected in 2015. I was first team all pro, played in my first Pro Bowl. Uh, funny story about the Pro Bowl. Uh, Kirsten, my wife, was pregnant with Weston at the time. She was like 36 weeks pregnant, and she's like, Pat, I'm going to Hawaii. I don't care. I'm coming. If, even if I have the baby on the plane, I'm like, you're crazy. <laughs> Your hormones are doing something to you right now. Uh, so she stayed back, but my parents uh, both flew out there, and we were going to, meet, uh, going to have dinner like a day or two before uh, the actual game. And I got off the elevator, and my mom got off the elevator at the same time. And I'm like, hey, like, how's everything going? She's like, good. I'm like, where's Dad? She goes, oh, he, uh, he went down to the lobby about an hour and a half ago just to sit there and creepily stare at the rest of the NFL guys. I'm like, what's wrong with him? Um, so, I mean, all pro, Pro Bowl. Um, I played, uh, like they said, in 2016, we won the NFC Championship, uh, played in the Super Bowl. Um, I know you guys are going to have some questions about that. and Come lightly, come lightly. Um, but, um, no, it's, uh, it's been a heck of a journey, and it's been incredible. As, as David mentioned, in uh, 20, the 2015-16, I was nominated the Atlanta Falcons, Walter Payton Man of the Year, and that's still, in my opinion, my highest honor. It's giving back to your community. It's being an ultimate teammate. Um, it's just living a life that God really – would approve of and um that's something that I've strived for throughout my entire career and uh that was just uh an incredible honor 
So this is where I'm going to tie it all together. So that was my football journey. Now we're going to roll into my faith journey. Um, I mean, isn't this picture beautiful? Like, my hairline is so much better there <laughs> than it is now. I mean, wow, this is like five years ago. Uh, but this is in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures uh, that's ever been taken of me. Um, just kind of, you know, every, every day before, or before every game, I, I run out and I run dead across the field. And I'm tired after I run 100 yards across the field. So I'm not sure if that's why I pray. I take a knee or what. <laughs> But uh, I always, you know, I, I hit a prayer uh, right then before the game. And, but uh, going into my faith journey, so I grew up in a Lutheran church in Orlando, Florida, and um, I didn't get it. Uh, church was, church just kind of was in the way for me on Sundays. I played AAU baseball growing up, so I had doubleheaders just about every Sunday. Uh, we were gone on tournaments, and um, church just seemed to kind of be an inconvenience, uh, especially for a young kid who just wanted to, run around and play sports and put pads on and just hit people really hard. Um, but so um, I, you know, I was baptized, uh, went through communion, was confirmed in the church. But, I mean, I didn't really, I didn't really get it. Um, I kind of, but, but I always had this opinion that I'm a Christian because I, I grew up in a church, uh, which I think a lot of young people kind of go through that and, I mean, I was really wrong. I, I was under the understanding uh, growing up that through religion, like good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. If I sin, I'm going to go for four. If I sin, I'm, I'm, I'm going to fumble or I'm going to throw an interception. Uh, and I was completely wrong. And then when I got to South Carolina, um, I think that's the next point. Uh, yeah, when I got to South Carolina, um, it didn't really go that smoothly in transition. My first two years, I was a wild child. I was out at the bars drinking, playing. I finally had my freedom, and I took advantage of it. And uh, I'm not very proud of it, but it's a part of my testimony. And then um, through all that, I was going to uh, the chapel services that our, that our team ran. Uh, Adrian Dupre, who's an incredible human being, kind of got me through a lot of that dark time in my life. Um, and I eventually got involved with the FCA department in South Carolina because the people that weren't doing the stuff that I was doing were going to these FCA things, and I was like, man, I, my life's just screwed up right now. I don't, I don't know exactly what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. So let me start just try to navigate and find out what all these – these people seem like they're doing life a lot better than me, and let me see what they're doing. So that's kind of how I got involved uh, with the FCA there. And one thing I really learned about that was – Religion versus relationship, and kind of going back to how, how I was raised was, you know, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. There's, there's repercussions for sin um, and stuff like that, but I, I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ at that point, so I didn't know about grace. I didn't know, um, I didn't, I mean, I knew all the stories in the Bible, but I didn't understand, like, the true purpose and meaning of it all. Um, and, like, like how, how can I say I'm a Christian if I don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ at this point in time? So uh, my wife was, she's not very vocal with her faith, but she's got it figured out when it comes to her relationship. Like, I look over there, and we're watching TV, and she's like, she's like, so 